couple of years ago, actually, IEEE Spectrum ran a story about the USC Institute for Creative Technology, um, where we compared uh, the real systems that you guys were working on with the, sort of the science fiction simulation systems in the Ender's Game a sort of book and then and later movie. Um, would you say that's kind of a fair introduction to the kind of work that the Institute does? I, you know, I, we're definitely inspired by, by science fiction, you know, and, and stories like that. Literature, science fiction, it's really society's way of, you know, playing with the ideas and trying to understand and deal with, with uh, you know, what the re repercussions would be or, you know, how things might be in the future. But we are, you know, working to try to understand, you know, what's the science and what's the engineering of it and how it really affects people. There are, of course, parallels. There are virtual characters and virtual companions that we've developed here at ICT that uh, can help train you and you know, provide some therapy, help educate you. Uh, so there's sort of a connection to, to Jane, the AI, in, in those stories. Um, and also, yeah, looking at virtual reality and visualizations and sort of gaming things out, uh, simulating things to understand what will happen, using those simulations to train other you know, soldier activities. The problem space that we're exploring uh, is largely soft skills like leadership, cultural sensitivity, decision making, um, critical thinking. A lot of the development that's going on right now in this field is led by the private sector. And the private sector, by design, they're trying to create products that they're gonna be able to sell. And that will lead you to very different solutions if you're trying to heal people or train people or educate people. Mm -hmm. Now it really does seem that, that the, the flow is coming in from the, the sort of civilian side. I mean, what are, what are some of the more core differences between, you know, what a military simulation of, we'll say, a town and, you know, the kind of technologies that are used for a Call of Duty type of thing? A lot of it is there's early investment from the military to sort of create the capabilities and then industry realizes that there's a use for it and that they can turn it into a product. And then you get this uh, economy of scale. And then you see really interesting things that, so it flows to the industry, but it also flows back to the military because yeah, now the head mount displays are really cheap. So we're starting this feedback where you can plant the seed and then you reap the harvest from, from industry. But it's also an area of research for us where we study what level of fidelity is necessary when, when, when the bar is a triple A game that you know, we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on, uh, it's easy for that to become the shiny object and say, well, well, we need that, we need that level. And what we found is that's not always true. I think fundamentally there for sort of seri so-called serious applications and serious games, there's a ground truth that you're held accountable to. And in the entertainment side, you don't have that. You, the, the laws of physics can be and in fact, there's a term for it, game physics, that you're not held to that standard of Newtonian physics. We're big fans of abstraction because really at the core, we're trying to understand what are the things that you really need to train someone on. And all of the shiny objects and the beautiful graphics could actually get in the way. You may be able to use uh, a graphic novel or um, 8-bit graphics like Minecraft. We've seen very rapid development in the hardware underlying augmented reality, virtual reality, and now mixed, mixed reality in the past few years. Um, but the software and the content doesn't seem to have advanced quite so far. And Todd, you've said that content and user experience require really significant experimentation at this stage, because these mediums are not just you know, another, another screen. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by that? If you go back and you consider paintings, for instance, um, we have centuries of the evolution of content creation that is focused on a bounded screen. And you can go all the way back to Greek theater. We have hundreds, if not thousands of years of figuring out how to represent image and represent story within a bounded screen environment. VR and AR essentially destroy those, those uh, boundaries because now my interaction is not bounded by a screen where I now have a reference for all the other things going on in the world. In VR, I'm completely immersed in that world. So that relationship between the human and the content and the experience that I'm creating is fundamentally different from TV and film. And we will figure out how to make effective um, experiences, but it's not gonna happen overnight. You know, Casablanca was not made in 1895. 
Mm -hmm. So it took time to figure out these mediums. 